All right, guys, so I'm going to be blogging to you today about recovering your costs as a litigant in person. Now, it goes without saying that in civil litigation, costs are absolutely fundamental. It's quite different, let's say, from the family courts, where judges often don't make costs orders against one party or the other, often because there's a child involved and it's you know shrinking the pot of money that's ultimately going to be paid out. So judges will have lots of interim hearings in the family courts, and never make cost orders against an opponent who's behaved wrongly and correctly, uh, wasted everybody's time, yeah? Uh, civil litigation is completely different. You, you often have um, a set of proceedings peppered with little interim hearings, whether it's a preliminary hearing, whether it's a case and cost management conference, might be a, an application uh, for strikeout or summary judgment, or an application for relief from sanction, or to set aside default judgment, da 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 pre-trial review, you know, disclosure hearing, um, all sorts of, there'll be all sorts of interim hearings. You probably don't realise that when you dive into litigation. It's not going to go from you issuing your statement of case and getting your defence to trial. There are all these phases in between. Uh, experts can generate additional hearings. And at the end of those hearings, this is the critical point of those interim hearings, a judge, after the sort of the uh, adjudication on the issue of that interim hearing, let's say you've got to uh, disclose a document that, that you failed to disclose as part of the disclosure phase of proceedings, the judge says, right, you know, I'm ordering that you, within 14 days, you disclose this document. Now, let's get on to costs. And you find this little mini trial of a cost issue after every interim hearing, just in respect of those costs that have been occasioned by the issue of the other party failing to disclose documents that they should have disclosed and you having to send a barrister or, or whatever, having to do your own legal work. I'll get on to towards the end of the vlog uh, why and how it is litigants and person can claim back for their own costs. Um, but let's say you send a barrister court, you know, it can be quite a big bill, two, two and a half thousand quid. Um, and the judge will make a ruling. And these are really powerful moments in litigation, because remember, the best strategy for a defendant is to ignore your claim and hope it will go away, as often as not, or a claimant who's a bit cocky about their case, you know, and a defendant gets an interim costs order against them. Uh, I'm going to, you know, so it's a very powerful tactical weapon. Everybody is in court, there's opportunities for a settlement, an opponent feels themselves on the back foot because they've lost an issue at an interim hearing. Um, and, you know, they've got to pay these costs like within 14 days. They're like, what? The judge has just hammered them with two and a half grand's worth of costs. Classic uh, example is where people have failed to properly particularise their statement of case. Yeah. Um, and so you see how important costs are in litigation. And, it's often the case, and I'll refer you to a vlog that I did on part 36, for instance, that costs very quickly become a bigger issue than the actual substantive issue of the claim. Okay, so that's by way of introduction. I'm going to deal with, I'll put up um, on the screen the, the topic areas that I'm going to touch on today. Um, so actually, I don't need to give you a little bit of introduction to what they are. I'm going to first deal with just the most common situation where the costs issue and recovering cost rears its ugly head. And that is, uh, we see this, you know, every other day of the week, uh, a, a, a litigant in person coming to us and saying, oh, handing us a court order. And on the court order is go away and amend your claim, which is, hasn't been properly particularized. And if you don't do it within 21 days, you'll be struck out. Uh, and here's a an, an, and because you've wasted everybody's time by not properly preparing your particulars of claim, even though it may be a fantastically strong claim, yeah, all these interim hearings are dealing with the procedural issues or getting organised, managing your paperwork. It's procedural law that's the key and the killer in civil litigation, not you know whether I'm in the right or they're in the wrong. Um, so that's a very common situation in which costs can punish an opponent. And then, 
you know, that person has got to go to a, a lawyer or a service like court wingman. So that's uh, one of the most common areas in which costs can be an issue. Now, if you are someone who, you know, let's say you're a defendant and you are faced with a dog's dinner of a statement of case and particulars of claim, really rather common, um, or whether you're a claimant who's faced with a dog's dinner of a defense, uh, you want to go after your opponent. This is a battle. It's a dog fight. Um, and you, before the hearing, uh, at least 24 hours, but give it as much time as you can, file at court and serve on your opponent a statement of costs, yeah, to drive the nail home. You don't Technically, under the CPR, you don't get your costs unless you filed a statement of what they are. So your statement reads, um, you know, I've spent five hours reading, uh, trying to make sense of a dog's dinner for particulars of claim. I've had to take some legal advice if you're looking in person, or I've had to instruct lawyers if you're um, uh, represented, yeah. Uh, well, in that case, they'll do the statement of, of, of costs for you and you sign them and date them. And then after that mini, uh, after the um, uh, hearing on the um, substantive issue, there will then be, as I say, the this sort of mini hearing on costs. And you say, Your Honour, have you got my statement of costs? The costs that have been occasioned by the improperly particularization of the statement of case by my opponent. Thank you very much, I want two and a half grand. Now he may go through and say, no, I'm not giving you that, I'm not giving you that, I'm not giving you that. And he may hack you down. And that's what judges do a lot of the time with costs, particularly when they're summarily assessed at the hearing itself. But if you don't ask, if you don't file that document, you don't get. So uh, let's just now come on to Something that perhaps as a looking in person, Joe Public, people don't fully understand, and that is a, a, a quite fair enough, really. Um, the, the principle of civil litigation is the winner gets their costs. Uh, unfortunately, and certainly historically in the practices, you very rarely get your full costs, yeah? So you've won your claim either at trial or more likely than not having settled it by means of a settlement agreement early on, a Tomlin order early on. Um, and you may not get anywhere near 100% of your costs. In fact, the yardstick that solicitors often use when advising their clients is you only get 75% of your costs back. So do factor that in. But this... Uh, little part of the vlog gets worse because things have evolved such that now uh, there is a rule of proportionality when courts are assessing the cost payable by one party to the winner. Uh, and proportionality unfortunately means that even if it's necessary and reasonable um, you don't necessarily get it. Now, let's take, for example, um, it might be reasonable to, you know, take a witness statement from a mechanic in a, an issue around damage to a car, let's say, or, you know, faulty repair, whatever it might be. Um, and, but the problem is, because how else are you going to prove that, that the workmanship was faulty? Um, but the problem is, what if it's an old Mini? one and a half grand and your claim value really effectively is only one and a half grand yeah um well let's say it's exactly the same scenario except you're driving a ferrari well the claim value is now you know two hundred thousand pounds sadly the system doesn't help the person with the old mini because it just you know it, it might take twenty five thousand pounds to run the proceedings it's exactly the same sort of facts and the law and the issues it's going to take the same amount of time uh, to run this claim um, but you've got massive discrepancy in the value of the two claims proportionality yeah 
and the value of the claim is one of the main, not the only, but one of you know the main criteria that a court is likely to apply when it's coming to uh, applying this rule of proportionality. So be careful. You might get your 75% hacked down even further, down to 50% with this new proportional proportionality rule. Um, so you know, beware of that. And you know, I'm fond of hammering away at uh, you know, soapboxing really about the fact that civil litigation is a commercial entrepreneurial endeavour. Now it's not really very commercial to bring a one and a half thousand pound claim because you're really angry with your local mechanic. Um, when you know and instruct lawyers uh, who have large court uh, court fees and whatnot or an experts fees, it uh, it's not really. Um, very commercial to bring that claim. I mean, even if it was in, in, in the fast track above 10,000, 25,000 legal fees to run to trial a 12,000 pound claim for faulty workmanship, again, the proportionality rule is going to apply. You're not going to get 25 grand all your legal costs back. You know, and the judge might just take a view, well, the claim value is 12 and a half, I'm going to give you 12 and a half. So, um, you know, obviously this can cut both ways. Uh, but do understand the principles of um, proportionality off the back of historically uh, courts hacking down uh, costs. Uh, and, and furthermore, we've now got the fixed cost regime that's just come in at the end of last year, uh, which means that it, you know it, there's a new track, an intermediate track on top of the small fast and multi-track, there's now an intermediate track between fast and multi, and there you've got to, and in the fast track in, in, in fact, you've got to ban your case according to complexity, which means you might not get your costs, but your full cost. But, but the principle of the fixed cost regime change is to cap costs, to now say not only, you know, they're not proportionate, but sorry mate, the procedural law says eh, you're not going to get any more than two and a half thousand pounds for preparing a witness statement. To take a random example, I've done a whole vlog on this issue, uh, so I won't go into it today. So uh, now, how can you insulate against that problem of maybe not getting your costs back? Aha, there's a video on part 36 offers. Sadly, if, if you're not a lawyer, don't attempt it try and get legal advice on drafting a part 36 offer because they are very technical and they have to be right and have to be pitched exactly right. Take a look at the part 36 vlog on that. Um, but you know, but even an ordinary offer is a way of insulating your costs. If a judge looks, you, you know, you've just won and he sees that 18 months ago you made an offer and you know, you've, you've actually got more at trial than the offer that you made or close to, or your opponent hasn't made any offers at all, then it's going to give you a high percentage. If you've offered mediation and the client, the, um, your opponent's rejected it, he's going to give you a higher percentage. Um, in the fixed cost regime, there are also, you know, uh, new rules, uh, which again, can give you a higher percentage and we'll come on to um, unreasonable conduct towards the end of the vlog as well. Um, so, you know, unreasonable conduct could be a way of, of breaking through that glass ceiling and that cap introduced by these new fixed uh, cost rules. So there are ways, uh, and, to, and, there's, and there's another way, and this is what uh, a good solicitor will always have their eye on, and often solicitors take their eye off the ball when it comes to offers. You know, they don't update or revise an offer because of a change in the complexion of the case. Uh, is, and now I'm moving on to indemnity and standard costs, okay, is, um, now what, and I'll just give you a little definition of what they mean. Um, standard, again, it's all enshrined in the CPR. When a judge or a cost judge comes on to assessing costs, they, the law gives them a yardstick. It's either a standard basis or a 
indemnity basis. Yeah, uh, broadly speaking, without getting too technical, indemnity means whoa, I can go at this and give the the winner a lot more costs. Standard means nah, and the wording is like any um, w where there's any doubt about what costs are to be paid, whether an item of cost is payable by the paying party, that doubt is resolved in favour of the receiving party. It's all a bit complicated, isn't it? Uh, uh, don't even get me started on what the word indemnity means. Basically, that word means, for our purposes, a bigger yardstick to beat the loser with. Standard is like, well, you're going to get 75% or even lower, and, you know, and then they apply the proportionality rules. So uh, as a, a, a good solicitor or a good litigant in person will be making offers, will be trying to avoid expensive proceedings, and particularly an expensive trial, etc., etc., will be drawing the court's attention to failings by their opponent, like asking for costs awards and unnecessary interim hearing or keeping a note of how many failures that your opponent has made in terms of uh, managing the proceedings properly, so that at the end they can ask the judge to apply the bigger yardstick, the indemnity yardstick, to beat the loser with. And that can be quite significant. Where Part 36 offers are concerned, the court must uh, apply the indemnity approach. Part 36, very powerful tool. It's so annoying that, you know, if, if you're, I hope that, the, that you are still with me. Um, I mean, you, the powers that be, you know, over the last few decades, in an attempt, and this is why the law is an ass, in an attempt to th make things fair, uh, in an attempt to make, you know, proceedings proportionate and not make them too burdensome for people and access to justice and all that good stuff, um, for all the right reasons, yeah, uh, legislators create laws and in civil litigation it's no different. The powers that be create new procedural laws and of course all they are is manner for lawyers. Yeah? Is it manner or is it Hannah? Manner from heaven. It's ka for lawyers. Yeah? Um, because you need someone to make sense of it. How, I mean, basically part 36, which is quite an intelligent idea, it, it excludes I mean, there's about 40% of cases in the courts are litigants in person because they're never going to be able to construct a part 36 correctly because of the te technicalities around it. Fixed cost regime, oh, more red tape. You can have a look at the civil procedures rules online. I mean, if, if the actual book itself is about that big. I, I've heard someone say, uh, someone, a fellow in the profession, that I think it's quite an interesting theory, that the people who make these laws, the Lord Wolfs and everybody at the very top, they only deal with big commercial cases in the high court, yeah? So it, it makes sense for a big high value commercial case, but for the, you know, the bread and butter cases that are going through the county court system, you know, the small, fast, intermediate now, and multi-track cases, up to 100k, etc. Um, it's a completely different landscape, but they're too senior to see what's happening in the trenches. Yeah. Okay. So I have mentioned a costs master here, and that brings me on to uh, a very important area of recovery of costs, and that is a detailed assessment. What do we mean by detailed assessment? Well, um, you may have seen it, uh, and here's a Tomlin order and settlement agreement by means of which most civil litigation is, is finished, or actually stayed technically, but anyway. Um, and you'll see that a very common clause in the settlement agreement, or the, or the Tomlin order, the covering page of the settlement agreement is the Tomlin order, because you're in proceedings, so you need the special Tom in order to bring an end to proceedings, which then has a settlement agreement, basically a contract between the parties, um, which could happen whether there are proceedings or not, and how, as to how it is they're resolving their dispute. Now the Tomlin order will often have a little clause on the top which, which, which will deal with costs. 
Um, and uh, a classic line that solicitors uh, invariably use is costs to be assessed if not agreed. The defendant pay the claimant's costs, comma, to be assessed if not agreed. Very common little phrase. Um, now, that brings me on to, you may not be aware of this, but there is a, a cost court. There are cost lawyers. There are lawyers and barristers who do nothing other when they get to the desk at 9am in the mornings than deal with cost proceedings after the main proceedings have been uh, settled or adjudicated to trial. Um, and they, they are worth their weight in gold, actually. We use cost lawyers. And, you know, if, we, if it's quite a high value case, we don't want a judge after a, a, a short trial, say, to summarily assess costs. Yeah? We want him to send costs to detailed assessment. Why don't we want him to summarily assess costs in you know, a higher value case? Because he is not a cost lawyer, he's just a judge, and he'll probably hack you down. Um, because he's not going to spend five hours looking through every item of work that you've done over the last 18 months. He's just going, oh no, you, you know, I'm going to give you 50% on the witness statement, the work of 10 hours you did on the witness statement. Oh no, this is, um, you can't justify that level of hourly rate or um, I don't think that expert was really necessary. You know, whatever it might be, he will, uh, you've sent way too many emails in this litigation. Um, so if, you know, it, it's often good, whether it's a trial or in settlement, to get that clause in because it, then after the, you know, the bun fight is over, you can then go to your opponent and you can say, right, here are my costs, and they're £25,000, um, pay them. And he goes, no, I'm good. I'll give you 12 and a half. And you say, well, okay, give me 17 and a half. He says, no, I'm not going to give you that. And you say, well, okay, let's go to detailed assessment. And it's easier than you think to go to detailed assessment if you've got a solicitor on your side because they will use one of their cost lawyers and they'll work no when no fee as often as not, which means that they will take their fee for fighting for your full costs of the of the litigation out of what the opponent has to pay and the opponent suddenly in a position where he's going to have to pay not only your you know a big proportion if not all of your costs is going to have to pay the cost of the your cost laws on top so that encourages settlement so in short uh, think very carefully before you let a district judge summarily assess your costs a, a district judge, uh, or, or well, not just a district judge, a circuit judge, you, you might be in front of a circuit judge, um, nearly always at interim hearings, they will summarily assess their costs because it's just, you know, for two and a half, take a two and a half grand. Um, remember, into, into him, interim hearing costs are uh, costs just to deal with the issue that's in front of the judge on that particular day of that hour, not obviously you, you're not obviously the judge is not making a decision about all costs in the proceedings because no one's won or lost yet so each mini battle um, a judge will usually summarily assess costs and that's when you put your statement of costs in front of him uh, right now I'm now going to get because you'll probably I've, I've talked so much about um, your costs and you're a litigant in person you're saying well what costs I can't claim costs that's when you instruct a lawyer isn't it uh, actually, no. Look at the CPR, and the you can claim nineteen pounds an hour for your time. Um, currently, as it stands, it's nineteen pounds according to the practice direction. You can't ever claim more than uh, two thirds of what a solicitor would get, but that's still very high, isn't it? Uh, and you can claim, the case law backs this up, that there's one case in which a litigant in person got £150 an hour. Uh, so, you know, be thinking about costs from, from day one. Here's a cost order that, we, that one of our clients uh, got um, after he won. 
at £19 an hour, see? So you can claim your own cost of running litigation. Now how do you do that? You need to be taking a note. Because remember, at the end of the day, when it comes to the issue of costs, like everything else, it's down to paperwork, preparation. You want to be able to hand up a detailed schedule of where you've spent your time uh, and what you consider to be the real loss to you. It's common sense. If you are you know, a professional chartered surveyor or an accountant or someone who's on an hourly rate and you spent a day in trial and you can prove to the court that you've had to cancel you know, um, a client or a conference or whatever it might be, um, and you can prove that, you can, uh, you, know, you can produce a witness statement with the evidence as to your losses, then the judge uh, will, or as often as not, if it comes to a cost court, what's called a master, will give you what you really lost, because that's the principle of civil litigation. The losses that you've suffered, both in respect of the main claim and in respect of the costs that you've suffered in, you know, so, you know, thankfully, uh, justice is right is still alive in the civil litigation system. So do, um, do remember this, because a lot of litigants in person seem to kind of like ignore the whole costs issue and just think, oh, and uh, fair enough, you get engaged in a big bit of litigation and it's, it's a, you know, such an emotional drain, isn't it, going through litigation, constantly there. Um, and it takes so long and you're, you know, you've chewed your fingernails right down to the bone by the time it gets anywhere near a trial. Well, you know, um, give yourself a little bit of a, a pick-me-up by keeping a note of the amount of time you've spent on this um, so that when it comes to it, you can claim. You can claim £19 an hour or if you can prove to the court on the balance of probabilities that your losses are far greater. I mean, let's say you're a... Um, a musician who'd have to cancel five gigs because you uh, you had trials and interim hearings and you had to spend the, the night before 10 o'clock hearing preparing for that hearing. You know, you could start to make an argument of quite a high level of uh, financial loss has been occasioned by you running your own case. So the courts uh, will, um, will give you costs, but you have to ask and you have to evidence your costs. Right, just two little final things. One is, what about support services? Not where you've instructed the solicitor and on, they're on the court record um, in the traditional way and they're conducting the proceedings for you, but obviously where you're a litigant person and you've had to go for support advice like to court wingman. Um, now, the, the case was very interesting. Historically, it was more difficult to get those that level of costs, but more and more, Though you should be asking for those costs, and uh, we've got a case where a litigant person got their court wingman costs awarded by the judge. We've got a, one case where they didn't. But I think you, it is an, that this isn't a positive trajectory because of Lord Wolfe uh, talking a lot about unbundled legal services, another confusing technical term, but basically it means this kind of support type service. And the CPR allows you to claim for, you know, the costs of legal services, and that can cover a support service like Court Wingman. It's not going to recover a McKenzie friend or a buddy that you just brought along to help you, but where you're getting specialist input into your case, uh, you should be claiming it. And in this particular judgment by Chief Master, um, he, he makes this point. And he talks about the relevant section in the CPR. And he says that, you know, within the spirit of the Lord Wolf changes and the provision of unbundled services, that's often typically where you just ask a solicitor to check over a document, but you don't want to do, him, do, do anything else. Or you ask them to just draft a Tomlin order and settlement agreement, say, or a part 36 offer, but you don't want to instruct them formally. That's kind of what un unbundled means. Don't know where they get the word unbundled from. Um, you know,
Yeah, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. The, the chief master in that case, uh, and you know, there's this important paragraph here, which you as a litigant in person should bring to the attention of the judge when it comes to costs, that uh, means the direction of travel is to getting your cost paid. Because, you know, as litigation gets more expensive, as the fixed costs come in, there are going to be more and more litigants in person judiciously using uh, legal services. Legal aid has been slashed, so they, you can't pay for a lawyer, so the powers that be are, will evolve the legal landscape so that the in person should, in my personal view, um, be able to claim for any specialist who's assist them in the running of their case, which has saved time. Because court wingman, let's be honest, saves a, courts a massive amount of time in making sure litigants in person prepare their paperwork properly. Okay, final uh, topic is small claims and uh, where costs can be claimed by a winner, even though the general rule is that you can't get your legal costs back in a small claim. Um, this is quite an important area, and in fact the case that I referred to earlier, uh, where, where we had a client who used court wingman, um, the, I believe the judge applied uh, this provision. Basically, where your opponent's conduct has been unreasonable, you can flip the rule that on the small claims track nobody gets their legal costs win or lose and get your legal costs back or some of them. I think it was interesting in that case, uh, if memory serves, in the I think it was the low amount of the court wingman costs, yeah, that the judge said, yeah, okay, you know, it's three hundred and sixty pounds or five hundred pounds or something like that. Um, so you can see how this kind of support service costs, you could, possibly, you, you could where a opponent has behaved unreasonably, get them back. If you don't ask, you don't get. Ask, yeah? Produce the invoices from the legal services provider uh, and ask. Um, now, don't get overconfident. Generally, judges do not want to depart from the general rule. That's the whole point of the small claims track. Uh, and that unreasonable conduct um, clause, the threshold is really quite high. You know, it's someone bringing a frivolous claim or, you know, or being virtually dishonest in the way that they've conducted the proceedings. And so you've got to, or, or just grossly incompetent maybe, but you've got to do more than than is the you know during proceedings everyone gets it wrong everyone makes mistakes everyone gets angry um, that's not going to wash it you do need to find something to hang the unreasonable conduct hat on um, but you know um, it is one of the many the very many weapons so I hope you'll see how civil litigation I mean you know I said at the beginning how civil litigation is all about costs. I hope you see now how fundamental cost is to civil litigation and how as often as not civil litigation becomes all about the costs. And this is one of the problems about having heavy duty lawyers involved is that the legal bill, you know, often um, it greatly exceeds the amount of money that's being fought over. Um, so I hope that has made sense. Um, you know, final plug, we can really help you in this area uh, with, you know, the costs issues, which are a bit technical at times, you know, particularly with the Part 36 issue. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. We charge um, a flat rate of 150, no VAT. I'm trying to keep the business so we don't have to charge generate so much that we have to pay that and I'm trying not to increase that 150 um, even in spite of the fact there's been a lot of inflation that's the figure we've had for nearly three years now to give people access um, you know make but but you know in return you've got to be organized and get your paperwork properly into chronological order 
into a nice PDF and a covering email short two paragraph if you want to use our service. Um, we will bill you if we get hundreds of emails after um, the legal surgery at five pound an email um, because we're just spending so much time dealing with cheeky follow-up queries. Uh, people are trying to get extra legal advice for free. If they went to a to a law firm, they'd be paying 250, 300 pound plus fat, 25 pound, 30 pound an email. Anyway, plug over. I think the important thing to take away is that you need to be judicious about the legal advice that you take in moderate to low value claims, but do take some legal advice, particularly at the start of the case, in order to avoid being punished by a cost order against you that's unnecessarily high, or to get your full cost back from your opponent, or in the case of Part 36, even extra bonus penalty costs. Goodbye for now.